to everybody in Suffolk for having us and for all the hard work in putting this festival together every year, but particularly with the technical challenges. She didn't point at me, but, but, but that was me. So I'm here now. I'm glad to be here. In terms of introductions today, uh, I'm going to do something a little different. Otherwise, I would say the title Virginia is for Mysteries approximately 47 times. I'm not going to do that. Three of our panelists today, Teresa Inge, Jane Ormerod, and Heather Widener, have appeared together in several anthologies of short fiction and novellas. The Virginia is for Mysteries series, which recently released its third volume, is a terrific collection. The Mutt Mysteries series of novellas and the anthology Fifty Shades of Cabernet. Sean Riley Simmons joined Teresa and Heather for the anthology Murder by the Glass Cocktail Mysteries. I believe Jane was abstaining for that anthology. <laughs> Teresa and Jane have also had stories in Coastal Crimes, Mysteries by the Sea. Heather has also had a story in Deadly Southern Charm. Jane has her own book of short stories, Going Coastal. And Sean has had stories in too many places for me to list in the 50 minutes for a lot of today. So something a little different here too. Congratulations to Sean on her Agatha Award for the last word in the 2019 Malice Domestic Anthology Mystery Most Edible and to her recent Agatha Award nomination this year for Bay of Reckoning and Murder on the Beach from the Destination Murders Anthology series. She also has a book in the other anthology from the Destination Murders Anthology series. I'm gonna jump in here myself since Sean and I both have recent stories in the just released anthology, Music of the Night from the Crime Writers Association in the UK. My name is Art Taylor. Uh, I'm primarily a short story writer myself and my collection is The Boy Detective and the Summer of 74 and Other Tales of Suspense. I don't know why I had to look down to, to say that I should know the title myself. And what now, in addition to all these short stories, several of the women here have also had uh, found time to write novels too. So a shout out in that direction. Jane's the author of the Blondes on the Beach mystery series. Sean is the author of the Red Carpet Catering mystery series. Heather's books include the Delaney Fitzgerald mystery series and the new Jules Keen Glamping mysteries, beginning with vintage trailers and blackmailers. So congratulations on all that to everyone. And I guess with all the introductions, we're out of time. I don't know where all the time went. No, seriously. <laughs> Um, one of the things I wanted to do in bringing that together like that is to emphasize not only the accomplishments of the women on the panel here, um, but also how tight the mystery community is and how close knit, how we all work together and not just work together, but celebrate one another's accomplishments. So please join me officially in welcoming everyone today. Thanks for spending time with us. I want to start out with kind of a simple question a lot of the questions I have are gonna focus on short stories, of course, since that's the, the, uh, the direction of the panel. So what is it that you enjoy about writing short stories? And what do you see as the challenges of writing in this form? I'm gonna start with Sean. And again, congratulations on the Agatha nominations. That's gonna bump you right here to the top of the uh, first panel, first question. Oh, thank well, thank you so much. And thanks for that lovely, um... Introduction well researched, and uh, if we had added your accolades to it, we'd still be talking because you know you are a master of the short story form, and we're very honored for you to be our moderator. I mean, thank you for oh. being here because uh, you know one of, you are one of my inspirations. So thanks that, thank for you. that. Yeah, and we are very close knit. I mean, I'm I feel like I'm very close friends with everyone here, and um, at, at least very good friends, if not really close friends. And um, that's the one thing about the mystery community I love the most. Um, the, the main thing. Writing short fiction for me was always, that's how it kind of started out. And I thought, um, is that like a writing career? Can you just write short stories? I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, when you're just like trying to figure out what, how to go when you're in your late teens, early twenties. And I thought, well, you know, obviously maybe novels is sort of the goal to get to, you know, cause I wasn't sure, but I really always enjoyed writing the short stories as the first thing I ever got any kind of attention for. Um, a professor of mine in college loved my stories and said, she told me, which, which might be the way of reason why I'm thinking this way. She said, you know, your stories are really wonderful. They're so, you know, I just, I find myself reading them again. And I think you're ready to write a novel. So maybe that was that wording she used. Like, I think you're ready now. Like I was, my training wheels were coming off or something, you know? Right. 
revisiting. I love writing short stories and novels at the same time. I like both um, disciplines. I, you know, I've often called it like a cross training sort of exercise. You know, writing short is keeps you keeps you honest, keeps you real live. You know, you have to shed those fancy extra words and the he says, she says, he reacted. You know, <laughs> any of the reaction things. You know, a lot of those things have to go because you have to keep it real tight. But that's really fun for me. I like a challenge. I like keeping things, um, you know, I like setting a goal for myself and reaching it. And to me, a 5,000 word goal is a goal and I'm going to get there, but you also have to be really tell a story with the beginning and middle and end in that space of time and uh, make it entertaining. So that's the challenge. That's what I like about it the most. So that's why, that's why I write short stories. And it turns out I've written way more short stories than novels, (laughs) I guess. I'm confused. I don't know which one I should be doing. I'm doing both. I'm just going to do both and keep going and have fun with it. Just what hat to have on today and then when to put the chef hat on as well, you know, because we got that in the mix too. Exactly. Teresa, I'm going to go to you next. You write primarily short, though novellas and short stories as well. So I want to talk to you. And plus, I know you've edited and organized anthologies. We're going to get to that question about editing and organization as well. But I want to hear what you, what draws you to the form, what you think the challenges are. Well, um, I've always loved reading short fiction, for example, Pose, The Telltale Heart, The Man of the Crowd. And um, that's actually what attracted me to writing short stories. I like that I can quickly introduce the characters, the setting and what's at stake, you know, to grab and hold the reader's attention in a shorter format. Um, For readers, I think the greatest advantage of a short story is the ability to read it in one setting. And the other thing I enjoy about short story writing is contributing to so many anthologies, which has been great to build my portfolio with publishing credits. And I get to meet new readers and I get to network with a lot of different authors. Um, As Art mentioned, we're a tight community. The mystery um, community community is tight. And I love working uh, with a variety of authors. The challenges, I think, of writing short, so there's, there's a couple of challenges building readership in the short fiction market, since some readers are not as familiar with short stories. I have to say when my stories first started getting published in anthologies, people would ask me, what is an anthology? They actually had no clue about short story collections. And the other challenge I'd say is finding um, open submission calls for short story writers. In addition, I would also add that while it has taken a while for short story market to emerge, it has been gaining momentum with both writers and readers, which is great. And I I really feel like the reason for this is today's readers are very savvy and they do enjoy reading short story collections. And we're now seeing more authors, as Sean mentioned, um, who write novels, they're actually contributing to more short story collections in between their novels. So we're now seeing more short stories in the market. And just one additional note on that is that writers can join short story groups online to network with other writers. They can join the Short Mystery Fiction Society. And of course, how we all met is Sisters in Crime chapters to learn about publishing opportunities. Good, good. Yeah, absolutely. Covering a lot of territory there. And we'll go into more detail in a couple of those directions later as well. Jane, uh, how about you? From a writer's standpoint, what draws you to the forum? What's 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 exciting about it? Well, I enjoy writing short stories because they are short. I can write one, you know, a couple of days, a few weeks, the project's done, it's out the door and I can start working on something else. And as Sean mentioned, those really tight word count limits make me right in that every word must count tight. Uh, I think it makes me a better writer overall. Uh, The challenges, of course, as Teresa mentioned, is getting, oh gosh, that comes next. Challenges are getting a fully fleshed out story with the three act story, developing characters the reader connects with, conflict resolution, at least in my case, a dead body, maybe two. Uh, Another challenge is a limited market for shorts, as Teresa mentioned. Um, I haven't found one for standalone short stories, but Mm -hmm. they can be used as lures and newsletter signups and other marketing strategies. Um, And of course, anthologies are great outlets, but the downside is the royalties on those are spread out amongst all the contributing authors. Uh, One of our Virginias for Mysteries had 17 authors. So that's a little teeny tiny piece of the pie you get. Um, So for me, short stories are not a get rich quick scheme. 
but on the plus side, it's a great way for me to get my name out there and to showcase my writing style. Yeah, I'm gonna do a quick follow up on that. When you when you talk about every word counting, and certainly that is is um, one of the aspects of a short story, or something here, is that for you an inspiration? Is that something you'd like? I love this, or is that like, oof, I got to make every word count, or is it both? It's work, but you know, when I'm doing the novel, I go on and on and on and I go back and look, I'm like, that word can go, that word can go. So it just, it teaches you to, you know, as Sean said, you know, you want to make, you don't say she, you get rid of some of the adverbs, you get rid of some of the, the flowery stuff and just make the story all about the story and not about, you know, the setting or the, all the side characters. So yeah, it just really helps tighten the writing. And I encourage people to write a short story. Um, just to learn that technique, because it does help. I think you can tell when you read a really long novel when the author needed to hit a word count and just starts mm. padding, <laughs> you know, the part that you skip over when you're reading. Um, so short stories does train you to be a much tighter writer. Nice. Heather? I would say saving the best for last, but everybody else is listening, so I won't say that. That's okay. <laughs> Alphabetically, I'm myself. always last. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's okay. I've been there. I've been there. I was a baker before I got married, so I, I was always at the front of the alphabet. But anyway, I agree with what everybody has said. Uh, the short stories offer me a challenge. I get to experiment a little bit more sometimes. Uh, I usually write humorous, cozy mysteries, so they're on the lighter, softer side. So short stories give me a chance to add maybe a little paranormal or a little noir or some suspense. So it's fun. And Jane is right. Every word does count. <laughs> good, good. Um, I'm going uh, to stick Heather and Teresa. I think, as I know, y'all were behind originally the Virginia is for Mystery series in terms of organizing and pulling it together. I may be wrong with that. Correct me if I am wrong. Um, I want to know how that series came to be. Uh, now, as I mentioned, it's in his third, got his third volume out. It's a terrific series. We have contributors that are coming in each of those, um, some of the same folks. Tell me a little bit about how that series came to be, um, either Teresa or Heather. We were at an event for the Library of Virginia. Goodness, it's been a while. And there were a lot of folks from the Sisters in Crime Mystery by the Sea chapter and from Sisters in Crime Central Virginia. And both chapters were rather small at that time. So we decided to pair up to put together an anthology. And it grew from that. I mean, it grew from how many authors did we have at first? Maybe 14? 15? I think, yeah. Maybe to, 15. Yeah. So it's, it's grown through the years. And I'll let Teresa tell the funny story about titles because Virginia's motto is Virginia's for lovers. And they've trademarked that. That's theirs. Ooh, yeah, yeah with, with that, um, so you learn a lot when you're doing research and when you're writing stories and books and all. But um, so we, I actually, I had to contact Virginia Tourism um, because it is trademark, Virginia is for, is trademark. So just like Virginia, for example, Virginia's for boating, Virginia's for camping. So Virginia is for mysteries would be, you know, Virginia's for is trademark. So I contacted tourism and our first title was Virginia is for murders. And tourism came back and said, no, <laughs> we will not accept that. No way. And they said, um, come back to us with another title. And so we came back with Virginia is for mysteries. They accepted it and um, approved it. And we've been using it ever since. And they even came to our first event. Someone from Virginia tourism came to our first event. But who knew? Who knew that? You know, but we've learned a lot along the way. So. It is trademark and uh, you have to get permission from the state to use it. So, so uh, they approved it, but they haven't yet, to my knowledge, set up like vending machines at the rest stops where you could pick it up or I mean, <laughs> yeah. any of that, that, not yet. So, mm -mm. so approval it's at a couple so of the, um, the stores at the state parks. Yeah, oh, good. some of those. And I oh, think good. Well, that's good to hear. I was making a joke. Yeah, it's but. been in, I think, um, couple or airport, a couple airports and different, different places like that too. So in Virginia. So, yeah. Well, that kind of leads, you know, I had a, a question I was thinking of. Virginia seems like a nice place. It is. Um, you know, we think about Virginia is for mysteries, Virginia is for murder. There's a lot of murders and other troubles in this anthology. So how, a more serious question, how does place inspire storytelling? Um, 
And I'm start with Jane. Uh, focus on your recent story. Sorry, wrong number. Um, you know, I want to touch on others too, but that one certainly is has a sense of place there. Very strong, Jane. Tell me about it. Sure. Thanks, Art. Um, well, my story, sorry, wrong number, is um, set in the coast of Virginia. Uh, our assignments for this story is you had to have it had to be in Virginia, and it had to showcase one of our landmarks. Um, so a lot of the writers are from the Hampton Roads area, and by volume three, we've kind of picked on a lot of them. So uh, I went on up the coast um, to, to use, and I mean, you've got this, you know, I don't know how many people have been to Chincoteague. It's famous for the ponies. Um, Misty of Chincoteague was made famous by Marguerite Henry way back in the forties. And so they run the ponies from Assateague to Chincoteague every year. So, and it's just the quintessential coastal town and it's so cute and remote and, and sky rises haven't in, you know, taken over yet. And then you kind of bring in a dead body. So the juxtaposition of this coastal setting and the murder, I just, I think it makes for great reading. Good, good, good. So you get a little bit of a trip and then you get yes. a little bit of suspense. Um, Heather, your story is a little different. I want to talk about the you know, Churchill uh, train tunnel collapse. You're, you've got, even if, if we're not drawing entirely on that, that's certainly part of the setting for it. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and how, how maybe that helped to inform what you did? I've been intrigued by that. We've lived here in Richmond now for about 30 years, and uh, we, there were ghost stories and ghost tours and all kinds of paranormal, and there's a vampire legend going on. Back in the trains were huge in Richmond. We're a hub for the East Coast. And this they built this tunnel and it was a mile long. It was the longest tunnel in the city and on the East Coast for the for a while. Uh, the soil here is clay and they had some issues and it wasn't as safe as they thought it was. So they stopped using it. And then in the 1920s, the railroad decided they needed more hubs, so they were going to expand this tunnel, and we were going to use it again. And when they did, it caused a cave-in, and it affected the houses that live above it on the hill, but it also came down on a train and about four workers. It could be more because they weren't really good with their records of day workers, so at least four bodies were trapped inside. So when rescue efforts failed, they ended up there was no more recovery. So they filled the tunnel, they sealed both ends. And to this day, the engine and the bodies are still in the tunnel. And I think every male that's ever lived here has tried to sneak into that tunnel or to break in it in some way. It was damaged. They tried to drill in the 90s to put cameras down and that caused more shaking and the people above weren't real thrilled with their homes. There's something called the Churchill Lean. And if you go up there, the houses have sort of a a slant to them because the tunnel settled through the years. So it was intriguing, it was exciting, it was very tragic. It spawned a lot of paranormal and ghost stories and vampire stories. So I added an extra body and there we are. And that works. You know, it, 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 it's interesting because even as you're talking about it, I was thinking how many different stories could be built on mm -hmm. even that one place. Um, again, on the top place, inspiring, Fiction, Teresa, Sean, anything to add there with a specific look at Virginia or not? Because Sean, I know you're up in Maryland. Teresa. Um, so one thing about Virginia is Virginia may be for lovers, except for when it's for killers, crooks and criminals. <laughs> so that's one thing about our great state. But yeah, I've, I set my stories. One of them was set at the historic Cavalier on the Hill Hotel in Virginia Beach, mm -hmm. which the hotel was built in 1927. And so it's got the um, uh, ocean as the, a backdrop view. And so it's beautiful. So that creates suspense. There also have been ghost stories there and uh, people, someone has jumped, allegedly jumped to their death from there. And so there's a lot of suspense in that. And the hotel has hosted nine U.S. presidents and icons, Judy Gar Garland and Jean Harlow, to name a few. So um, and then my other story is set in Virginia Beach at a boozy bar. It's a famous boozy bar that was there for 50 years. So that adds some suspense as well. Sean, our Marylander. Here I am. The, uh, visiting down here, zooming in. Go ahead. I love listening to your accents, <laughs> even though we're, we're not that far apart. Um, well, I'm from, I've lived in Maryland.
Maryland longer than I've lived anywhere else, but I am from Indiana. I'm from the, I'm a Midwestern person. I had mid Midwestern family, but I never lived there. I grew up in South Florida near Miami, which was a whole different scene culturally and um, weather wise. And then moved up to Maryland. I lived in New York. I've lived there, you know, lived a lot of places and I've traveled a lot. I worked for an international airline for a long time. So I got to go, you know, early on to, you know, different places, the Caribbean and Europe and things on my own. So um, place is always interesting to choose from because I could say, well, I'll just think back to when I lived in near Miami and I'll write a story there. <laughs> or um, I'm in these destination murder um, anthologies now. And the first one was murder on the beach. And I'm like, oh, I got I got this, you know, beach is my thing. And uh, we have a our family owns a house that we're able to use um, every summer in Ocean City, Maryland. So um, we are beach people. So that was very that's easy to draw on. The mountains and one's a little bit more, um, I've only been, I used to ski a lot in Vermont when I was in college. I would go up off quite often and ski. So I had to draw back on some of those memories. And I thought I've already written a kind of a Vermont skiing story. Um, so I thought I was watching Jack Irish at the time on TV when they put out this call. And I'm like, I just think it's so cool. Like he's, I just was fascinated with um, Guy Pierce and Jack Irish in Australia. And they it was like, oh, they have mountains there. So I set my story there. I just did all this research on Australian mountains and I set my story there, even though I've never been there. I, I aspire to go there one day. But I think that's what's cool as a writer because you can sort of travel in your mind. I mean, obviously you want to, I feel like you need to draw on some personal experience you've had. You know what it feels like to be sort of out of breath, maybe if you're going up a mountain, you know, that, you know, to be able to translate it, that into your work. And I think that is helpful, but you don't have to have gone to Australia to write a story about it. You know what I mean? So um, sure. that's, that's the fun part about place. You can vary it. And I write a lot of stories about people just sitting in their apartments because I lived in New York for like eight years, nine years. <laughs> Sometimes you're just sitting in your apartment and things happen to you and you're like, ah, you know, a cat scratches on the window and it scares you, you know, stuff like that. But um, yeah, places, I like the idea of um, um, having a place, but I don't always, I don't rely on it to, to write a story, but it is fun to explore new places in your mind. Yeah, you know, travel, you mentioned travel a little bit. It's interesting how you're seeing a place from a different point of view, whether it's a place you're from or a place you haven't been before, can begin to set the imagination uh, to work in some way. A trip yeah. to uh, New Mexico that, that my wife, Tara Laskowski, and I took a while back was the inspiration for the story, Rearview Mirror, that eventually became my, my first book, On the Road with Dell and Louise. And, and then there's a, a, little, a little bit for those folks who are uh, in Northern Virginia or no Northern Virginia, a really curvy road that goes out to Clifton, Virginia, the beautiful but small town of Clifton. And that curvy road, because of the twists and turns, inspired some twists and turns in a story of mine as well, parallel play. So, so place absolutely can be an inspiration. There's another little bit that I have, have, have seen, both in some of the Virginia is for mysteries stories and also in a couple of the anthologies we mentioned. Um, and that's that they're often focused on wine. Um, Teresa, and uh, Jane, both of you had stories in the Virginias for Mysteries uh, series that focused on wine. Heather, story in Fifty Shades of Cabernet. We also have Murder by the Glass. Um, I know it is only 9.25 in the morning. It is too early for drinks or cocktails. We're going to talk about it anyway. Um, how do wine and cocktails inspire tales of murder? Jane, I'm going to start with you and then go to Teresa and we'll go from there. Well, in Vino Veritas, in wine, there is truth. And I do think secrets slip when someone has over imbibed. And of course, secrets are a good element to have in a good mystery. Uh, and a person under the influence doesn't always have really good judgment or sense of consequences. So it might be a little easier for them to hurt or kill someone. I don't know for sure. I've never been that drunk, but uh, I have heard tales of that. Um, and I think wine and cocktails open options when writing a character, allowing them to step outside of their selves and do different things they might not do when they're sober. Um, I think wine and cocktails have a universal appeal, uh, certainly judging by the liquor sales during the pandemic. Um, lots of people out there can relate. And again, as a wine drinker, and I'm far from a connoisseur, I buy it based on the label, not anything else. Um, I write what I know. <laughs> that's, that's, I, think, I think so many people buy based on the label and I read somewhere that if there's an animal in the name or an animal on the label that that automatically means more I don't know why more sales Teresa I'll stop me talking go ahead tell me about <laughs> well I agree with Jane so I think it requires just the right blend so um 
In Virginia's for Mysteries 2, My Story Court for Murder features a bridal party, a wine tasting, and a drunk drunken bridesmaid, which is a perfect mix for murder. And in Murder by the Glass, um, my story Murder on Tap blends a mystery writer's conference, a rival author, and a suspicious hotel bartender. So I really feel like um, having a perfect blend and the cocktails or wine really is what makes it. I definitely agree with Jane. And a little side note, Jane may not like this, but we have shared a few glasses of wine together over the years. So. That's no secret. It's no secret. I think we all have. And, you know, Malice Domestic, we're going to get to Malice Domestic in a little bit. But, you know, that's the place where everybody bonds, talking about the community coming together. Often it's the lounge, it's the bar, it's the restaurant, it's food, too. So, Heather, Sean, anything to add while we're, we're talking cocktails and wine? No good murder mystery starts with a salad, though. You have to have the wine, the cocktails, the conversations. <laughs> Somebody tweet that out now, you know, and attribute <laughs> Heather. So. Well, when you said it was too early, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Mimosas are fine, right? We can have Somebody, mimosas. Somebody put mimosas in the chat. So there, yeah, there, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, used to, I, used to, I have a story in Murder in the Glass, too. And thank you guys so much for asking me. And that was really fun to write because I used to sell wine. I'm actually wine certified in the state of Maryland. I have a, I tend to take courses and like learn how wine is made and all that kind of stuff. So that was my job for a couple of years. I would basically go to 10 to 12 clients a day and taste wine starting at nine in the morning and finishing up at the end of the day, which whatever, whenever that would be, maybe it was eight o'clock at night, just depending on how good the day was. And you're supposed to, sometimes you're supposed to spit, but we, nobody, nobody spits. No, no one's doing that. Little taste, but um, I would consult on wine lists and different things, but um. It was really interesting job because I would go to like a really nice country club and people, you know, rolling around playing golf. And then I would go to a biker bar because they had, you know, Sutter Home White Zinfandel as their wine. I'd, you know, I'd have to go there and say, hey, I'd have to go to all these places. And I've made friends with all these different kinds of people that owned businesses. And, it, you know, there were not one that was the same. So that's why the inspiration for that story was because I literally would go to a biker bar once a week and check in and make sure they had enough uh, Sutter Home White Zinfandel so they could have their um cowboy cocktail party they had little the little the little ones they put a straw in it and they would have like line dancing and um they drank that they drank they cut them cow, cowgirl cocktails what they called it so i made a lot of money off of them <laughs> it was very anyway it was like you say when people have a few their inhibitions fall and um they may say or do inappropriate things maybe murder but i've had a, a way large number of inappropriate things said to me during that job from clients it's because I was the only one there, you know, we're drinking and it's, you know, whatever. So yeah, there's, yeah. and I might have, I might feel like murdering someone during that time. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, Rosalie Spielman said online, I might murder after a salad. So I, 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 I'm, we're going to go back on the salad thing, but you're right. And I think about what Teresa said, you get, you know, bridesmaids, weddings set up. I mean, there's so many things that happen in that. So we got place and all of a sudden you add a little bit of loosening of inhibitions. I've got story ideas coming already. Um, we got the, uh, the, the, you know, 50 Shades of Cabernet is a great title. Um, we've got these themed anthologies. Virginia's for Mysteries obviously is a, is a different kind of theme there. I wanna talk about bringing the anthologies together a little more. Um, also, and I mentioned earlier, Heather, Teresa, Jane, part of the Mutt Mysteries novellas anthology. Um, tell me a little bit about from the, the editing side, the creation side, a little bit more about how you come up with these ideas, how you bring the themes together, get the contributors on board. Tell me about that. Teresa, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, so um, they're a lot of fun, I have to tell you. We've done a lot over the years, and um, I love brainstorming the themes for each book with my partners in crime, who are Heather and Jane. Sometimes we brainstorm the themes over dinner and wine, and sometimes we brainstorm on a napkin in the bar at Malice. So if you see us in Malice writing on a napkin, we're brainstorming our next book. Um, for instance, the theme for Murder by the Glass has short stories that blend a baffling mystery and a glass or more of murder. And the theme for Mutt Mysteries, um, the first book, The To Fetch a Thief, has four fun tales of theft and murder. And then Virginia's for Mysteries, the stories are set in Virginia with a Virginia landmark, a crime and a murder. 
Um, regarding the editing side, I I always love working with the contributors and seeing all the stories come together in the end, which to me includes something for every reader due to the various writers and voices in, in the book. So it's a lot of fun. Um, sometimes we will handpick um, contributors for the books. And I have to tell you, it's really wonderful working with so many different authors. And as Sean mentioned, she was in Murder by the Glass, and um, it was a lot of fun. And she mentioned her story, and I loved her story. I just loved it. I still do. But yeah, it's a lot of fun working with so many different contributors and pulling it all together, getting it published, and then doing your signings together as well. It's just a, a great community, I have to say. Okay, I'm going to hold Jane for last on this. I got a different twist on this question, but Heather, Sean, from an editing standpoint, um, and Sean, I know you're involved with the Malice Domestic Anthologies too. Heather, Sean? This is the IT side of me. I'm, I'm IT project process oriented during my day job. So I think you always need to have some kind of structure to it, just so that people understand. Because if you're doing a cozy series, you don't want someone coming in with a different theme or a different genre. So you do have to kind of put some guardrails around it and then some expectations that this is a group project. So everybody is, you don't have to do everything, but we do need you to help pr you know, promote and do some marketing. And then we also need some help with, uh, you have to agree to be edited. And that sounds silly, but a lot of first time authors have issues with having someone edit their work. and. I love my editors because they see things that I don't see or I've missed or I've stared at it way too long. And it, it, it's, it's a learning process. I mean, it, it is tough to put your story out there the first time, but it is so worth it. <laughs> you know, I'm going to add, of course, you mentioned Sisters in Crime before, um, the idea of the Sisters in Crime chapter anthologies. Um, and, and any sort of anthology like this, one of the things I think is exciting about it is the opportunity for a first time writer to be in the same book as a well-known veteran mystery writer um, that you know helps to bring attention to the person that's getting published for the first time. But it also, as you said, gets that first time author through the editing process, everything from, from acceptance to the editing, to the copy editing, to the marketing. And, and, and I think that's very exciting about these anthologies. Sean, anything to add? And then I have a question for Jane. No, that, but that's a very good point. And I, that, that's to me is always the coolest um, aspect because for, for both the Malice um, anthologies that come out of here and the Level Best anthologies that we helmed up for the last five years for New England, we threw it wide open. So submissions are coming in. We would get hundreds of submissions. We, we do. For Malice, we get over, we get over like around 120 every time. And for Level Best, we're getting like 300 submissions. So these are people we've never heard of. They just saw us. They found us however way. Um, for Malice, it's always a, we choose a panel from the community, like Art, you've done it for us before. We don't do the reading. So we sort of, you know, also want to share that experience, share, can you read 120 stories for us, please? <laughs> you know, and choose some. And I think that's a great way to bring different perspectives, um, taste, different things to the book. And then it comes to us and we do the reading too. So it's, they go through a lot of different processes to get there. But um, the cool thing about it is every single time it's like, well, this is a, this is a debut author and they're so excited and they're just thrilled to be in it. And they, you know, are, I've never had any issues with anyone with the editing piece, thank goodness. I mean, I, but I'm always like, hey, this is what I think. What do you think? You know, no, I'm never like, a, you know how I am. But um, yeah, so it, it's really, really fun to see people making their mark first time in a book. I mean, that's my favorite thing, just, just making new friends and discovering new writers, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I edited a couple of the Bausher Khan anthologies. Bausher Khan is the World Mystery Convention. And uh, the one I edited for the Raleigh Bausher Khan, Murder Under the Oaks, uh, Chris Kiska, who is, of course, you know, part of this community as well, um, had her first published story, I believe it was, uh, in, in that collection. And it couldn't have been more excited. I was excited to have Margaret Marin in there and Tom Franklin and some big name folks. But but that, that debut is the one I'm going to remember. Jane, you've had your own collection of short stories, Going Coastal. Tell me a little bit about how that came about. And, and uh... Well, they were sitting there. <laughs> they weren't going anywhere. So I pulled them together myself. It's two novellas and two short stories. So you get a little taste of both. Um, it's 
they didn't get accepted anywhere. And I really liked the stories and believed in them. So I pulled them together into going coastal. And it's got a theme as well. I mean, just with the coastal, there is a, a, a theme of place to it. Well, I'd like to say I write coastal cozies with a splash of humor. So I have, uh, they all do take place along the coast. And usually I use fictional towns because, um, you know, the, the Cabot Cove syndrome, where you think, I think it has the highest murder per capita rate in the world, but it is fictional. <laughs> so, um, I went to try to visit it once and it's not real. I was shocked. It seems so real on TV. It does. It's actually it does. in California. Um, I am, am watching the time. I've got another question, then we'll go to, go to the q and I want to encourage people, if they do have questions, to put them in the Q&A. We'll take a look at that. The question I have before we do that, and this is going to stick with Jane for a minute, is uh, the folks who write novels as well here, how do your short stories seem to be of a piece with your novels? Jane, I know you're writing a lot about the coast, um, or how does the short story give you a chance to write in another direction? Um, Jane, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, well, um, I don't know who said it, but someone wiser than me said a short story is like a love affair, a novel is like a marriage. So you kind of get that, um, you know, novels are a commitment. And, uh, it, and I think the same thing is true. You have to have all the story elements there. But as Teresa mentioned in the opening, um, if you don't have a lot of time, short stories are better. But when it comes to me, I try to use the same voice. Um, so there is, when you pick up one of my books, you should see pretty much the same voice, usually a female character, an amateur sleuth, mm -hmm. um, usually drinks wine. Um, these are not autobiographical, I promise you that. <laughs> but yeah, there is a little bit of me in them. Everybody says that. But yeah, I do think that short stories writing like I said in the beginning, it's just writing tighter um, and still getting all the elements there that makes her a good story. Good, good. Uh, Heather and Sean, both of you write longer works as well. How do the short stories fit or go in a different direction? Um, none, I've never written a short story with any of my novel characters. I write sort of a long running series that has seven books. There's an eighth one written. So I've spent a lot of time with those folks. And um, when I go, like Jane said, I want to go have a love affair, a, a fling. I want to have a fling with someone outside my mirror. <laughs> not really, not in real life. You know what I'm talking about. But um, that's where I like to stretch. Disclaimers and, in all directions here. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, that's going to like, that's a sound clip that someone will take out of context. Um, no, the one I wrote, the most recent one, Art and I are in um, Music of the Night, which is the CWA anthology, which I'm so, I mean, I, when I saw your name, I was like, yay, we're the two Americans. There's only two of us. And um, that one is a, more like a horror story that I don't, you know, I just for some reason felt weird that day and wrote it like a little bloody kind of horror story. And that's why it's fun. I just like to stretch and do something completely off base from my um, traditional mystery novels, which I also love to write. And I love my marriage with them too. I love the fling and uh, the, you know, the, the allusion to the fling. I think that's a great, it, you know, it's a great mental picture of it because you do kind of experiment sometimes in your short stories. I've, I've done two where I used my characters from my private eye series, but that's because I had some chapters that didn't fit in the novel and it was easy to tailor them into a, a short story. So that was fun too, to, to bring them back for a, a quick fit. All right, I'm looking at some of the Q&A uh, questions that we've got. A couple of them are looking at the question of like word count but in different directions. For example, I have a question, what do you think of novellas compared to short stories? Uh, also, Kim Thorne asked in the anthologies, how many total words you usually shoot for to keep it a true short story, but also get all of your details in? Um, let's talk about length a little bit. Obviously, a short story can be everything from 100 words or so for that micro fiction, flash fiction, that's obviously a different animal, to a, an 18,000 word novella, maybe at an, another end. Um, what's the sweet spot for you? What do you aim for? Um, what do you think about writing at that, that novella length versus a short story? Well, from the publisher standpoint, it depends on how many authors we have in something. Like for Mutt Mysteries, we only have four authors. So they each had to turn in 14 to 18,000 words. Uh, but then in the Virginia's for Mysteries, if you have 17 authors, you still want to keep the total book flank at about 70,000 words. So you divvy that up and, and kind of give them those parameters. Some people come in way short and some people come in way over, uh, but usually it balances itself out. 
I know my sweet spot, it seems like has been, I mean, it just depends, but around 3,500 to 4,000 words I have found. <clears throat> I don't know why it's worked out like that, but it just has over, over the years with all these um, anthologies. But that just seems to be my sweet spot. And like we said earlier, every word counts, um, every sentence, every paragraph to move the story forward. I just keep it very tight. Um, but that seems to be my sweet spot. Generally around five to six for me. That's what, because that's usually what the, whenever I've seen a call for stories, it's around that number. So I guess I just figured that was what it was supposed to be. <laughs> so I just end up training myself to write a story with a, within around 5,000 words. But the one, um, the the odd one that I, I won the Agatha for a couple of years ago was, I, I think it was only like 25 or 3,000. It was low, it was a short one for me. So that was, uh, I was like, well, maybe I should write shorter. I don't know. But yeah, it was fun to be able to do whatever you want. As long as they don't go way over what someone's asking for, because I don't think that's what people are asking for. And I don't like it when people do that to us. You know, and send me a 10,000 word story if I've asked you for five. You know what I mean? Just because, you know, that's what we asked for. Heather? I tend to be one of those odd people who gain word counts during editing. <laughs> I always come up short <laughs> on the first draft, but mine are about, like Sean said, anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 words. Yeah, I tend, you know, I tend to, I tend to write long and then have to cut back and back. like fold and tuck and trim and, and that sort of thing. A couple of questions as well from, uh, and we have a fair number of writers in attendance uh, here. Grace Topping asked the main thing that makes you select or reject a short story from an anthology. Nancy Nagel's got one that sort of echoes with this uh, for new writers wanting to get, and Nancy's not a new writer, she's very successful as we all know, but for new writers who want to give short fiction a try, what are uh, one or two top things to keep in mind uh, as you're going? So what to look for and what might be a, a, a thing that would cause a, a story to be rejected? Tips. Well, one thing I would say is stick to the theme. If there's a theme, uh, stick to the theme and the word count, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's basically it. Follow the directions that were handed to you. Basically, you know, sometimes we get stuff that it's like, well, this is really good, but it's nothing to do with what we're sort of asking for. You know? <laughs> right. We don't why why open yourself up for a rejection out of the box, you know. And it's called a collection, so there's a collection of a certain theme. So, it's really best to follow the guidelines. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about tips just generally for, for for writing short? I know we've talked about make every word count. We've talked, I've used the phrase folding and tucking and making sure, you know, trimming stuff down. You know, what what if, if somebody's trying this form for the first time wants to get into writing short stories? Tip. I suggest reading some short stories to get an idea of the pacing and, um, you know, how much you have to do and, you know, you have to focus on really and truly it's just one element. You can't like a novel, go out and have dinner and all that stuff. It just has, like you said, really tight. But I think reading them first will give you um, a flair for what's, and then especially if you're looking for something that's already like the uh, Malice Domestic ones, they're looking for a certain style too. So if you want to get into Malice Domestic, read some of those anthologies um, and get an idea for voices and stuff. Great advice. Uh, Nancy's got a, Nancy Nagel has a second question. Um, and it goes back to the issue of place. Do you like to set your stories in real places or fictional spots? And she, there's some context for this. Wondering if writing a real setting helps with shorter word length, since the world building would be more familiar. If you set it in a place that's well known, that's less you've got to do to build up the place. What are some thoughts on that? I'll say a lot of my coastal settings are kind of universal. You know, we have all these towns up and down the East Coast that are so just by setting it, say, Chincoteague had to be real for Virginia's for Mysteries, but a lot of my other stories are Chincoteague like without the ponies. So, um, yeah, it, it, you can get through that. Uh, you know, in the short stories, you don't really focus as much on setting. Like you said, you don't have the words to do that. So you just kind of generalize and uh, keep it simple. I, I Put a couple anthologies together here in my neighborhood and we have to be very careful because we don't want to be known as the murder capital of Norfolk although we're pretty close to it so um, you, you do have to also take into account where it's set and what uh, what perception you're putting out there in that regard 
Well, one thing I'd say too is, um, so most of my stories are set. I actually set them in real settings, Virginia Beach and Outer Banks. Um, for those that know me, I go to Outer Banks a lot in the summer. I live close to it. I love it. I do a lot of day trips down there and um, just love it. But um, as Jane mentioned, um, you know, setting in short stories, if you are going to mention maybe a bypass or a road uh, or whatever, make sure you get it right um, with the proper name. Really, you got to get it right because people will come back and say, oh, that's that's not correct. So you got to do some research as far as that goes. So, Yeah, I tend to fictionalize towns because I don't want that yeah. to happen. <laughs> And it will. They'll come yeah. back. <laughs> Ice cream parlors on the other corner. Like, ah. <laughs> That's not the flavor they have. So anyway. <laughs> not open um, we are, you know, it's like I am watching thing. the time uh, closely. We've got two more minutes. I want to, I know there are other questions in the Q&A. I want to get this question out there, though. I know a lot of readers, um, as a short story writer myself, a lot of readers will be resistant a little bit uh, to picking up an anthology or going for a short story. They want that more immersive experience about novels. A last word before we got to close. What would you tell those readers to encourage them to try out the form, check out an anthology, give short fiction a chance? Anybody? Well, anybody who likes wine tasting knows you don't go and drink a whole bottle of everything they have. You drink a little sampling. And so I think short stories are like wine tastings. You get a sample of a bunch of different authors. And if you like their voice and their style, you can go have a longer fling with their novel. And mm -hmm. I, I agree for readers who are hesitant about short stories. It's really a chance to be introduced to short fiction. You get to know the author. I often hear from readers that um, it's very satisfying. They can read the story in one setting and they finish it and it's complete. So there are there are some advantages to short stories and reading them. And attention spans have shortened over the years. I mean, we're a three second generation. If that website doesn't pop up, we've moved on to something else. So short stories fit within that thought process. You can read a couple, go to bed, do something else, pick it up whenever you have some time. Anthologies on the bedside table are the best because you can mm -hmm. go to sleep, you read a story and you fall asleep because it's, you can manage that. You can get a 20 minute, 30 minute story and then you're not using a screen. Yep. You, can, you can read. Some read, read on their phone too. And yeah. it's an easy read. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I've got our anthology, Sean, on my bedside table, Music of the Night. I'm working through it now. It's a great anthology, uh, as are all of the ones that we talked about today. I would encourage folks, if you haven't already, to pick up the Virginia is for Mysteries series to get Fifty Shades of Cabernet, to get all the ones that I talked about. Um, we are at our time limit. Thank you so much to all the panelists for coming. Thanks to the Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival for having us. Thanks for the folks that showed up today. Listen, I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but we appreciate it so much. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Art. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Yeah, it was wonderful.